Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Uh, it's wonderful to see such a, a big crowd. Thank you so much. We are today uh, very privileged uh, to come to a country tomorrow morning that is really on the cusp of incredibly exciting developments. Uh, it doesn't happen very often in the 21st century that you can, you know, be there when history is made. And we're coming to Myanmar, literally, as the country is trying to reinvent itself. Reinvent itself after more than 50 years, a half century of suppression, of repression, of really living in the Stone Age, and I'll show you some of those things uh, today. Uh, just two weeks ago, the country uh, inaugurated its first elected president. Uh, just last Sunday, uh, the first batch of 80 prisoners, political prisoners, were released. So it will be very exciting over the next three days to see, to to, to feel the pulse of a nation as it finally embraces the cultural values and the political values that we hold so dear in, in the Western world. Now, many of you have asked about my book, so let me just take two minutes and quickly tell you a little bit about what I do. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a historian, and I am particularly interested in ancient civilizations. That's my expertise in the Middle East and Asia, uh, where I have spent uh, a lot of my research. Uh, and my, my work with National Geographic started 10 years ago. I had this crazy idea of writing a book about uh, placing the biblical stories, both Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, to take them as stories and to place them in the context of the geography, the literature, the culture, the, the way of life of the territories in which these stories emerged. Mesopotamia, Egypt, ancient Egypt, of course, Syria, Canaan, uh, and then Galilee. And uh, my agent had pitched this idea to, I don't know how many publishers. I had so many reject letters, I could wallpaper my house with them. Uh, which, if I remember the wallpaper we had at the time, was probably going to be a good idea anyway. But uh, National Geographic decided to take the plunge, and the book became one of the top-selling books in its history. Just, I, I always mention this to my students. I said, don't get reject dejected when you get a reject letter. Just keep at it. So since then, with National Geographic, I've published uh, now seven books, about these ancient civilizations. I did the same with uh, In the Footsteps of Jesus, which became a bestseller as well. Uh, the book that I will be referring when we come close to Oman is From Moses to Muhammad, which is a book that was published by Bertelsmann uh, about eight years ago, and it's now in its third print. And in fact, Apple has uh, made a multimedia version of it with lots of video, and you can get it on Apple iTunes. A Story of Christianity is a book that was published uh, two years ago, which is the biggest one. It really tracks Western civilization from its origins in Galilee all the way across the world to today. And I will be using some of the wonderful maps that the cartography section of National Geographic made for that book. As we talk to, about India, because one of the things we do is chart the way in which Portuguese and Dutch and then British navigators really canvassed and unlocked the world that we are going to see on this cruise. And then finally, I also worked with some other publishers, and just last month, uh, Random House uh, published this book, Ten Prayers to Change the World, which is really about ten spiritual moments from Abraham to Gandhi that played a major role in history, and I don't want to talk about it right now, but we'll uh, I have a separate lecture about that specifically as it relates to Gandhi and Mother Teresa, who of course will be very important for uh, our talk when we get close to, to India. Today, however, the topic is Myanmar, 
or Burma. And uh, we were just talking uh, just a few minutes ago, the confusion that exists around, you know, is it Myanmar or is it Burma? President Obama always says, that, <laughs> says them both because he realizes that most, most of us don't really know what Myanmar is. So when he, he refers to Myanmar, he says, that's Burma. And the State Department does the same thing in the United States. Uh, when you, I, I looked at some of the ways that the country is referred to in other cultures, and most of them still refer to Burma, even the European Union. So uh, it, it, it all, the, both names, though, derive from the same term, Bima. And Bima, are, or Bamar, if you would pronounce it in the anglicized way, is the dominant population in Myanmar. Myanmar, and this is very important to remember, is a nation of countless ethnicities who are always at each other's throats. And that is why the military junta has kept itself in power for so long. The tension between its multiple ethnicities is what basically gave them the fig leaf to uh, stop democracy in, in Burma, as we will see in a moment. Uh, and so, as a result, until very recently, it was one of the most backwards nations in the world. It's sort of the North Korea of Asia, if you will. Not only because of its repression, but also because of its, its incredible economic inequality. Even today, it is the most a nation with the greatest inequality, and we'll, we'll see some other reasons why that is. It only gained independence just very, very recently. Uh, in the 19th century, the British really wanted to have this country. And the reason is that it has many, many uh, rich ores, minerals, as well as a very rich agricultural uh, territory. And so it waged three wars between the Burmese, which was an independent kingdom at the time, and finally, in 1886, the, uh, the armies of the Burmese king uh, were defeated, and the British came in, and that's where the British uh, history starts. Of the we'll talk a lot more about the Raj and the British Empire when we come to India. So I want to today I want to basically focus on Burmese culture and the wonderful things we're going to see there. Uh, uh, and leave the story of the British Raj for, for a later lecture, if, if that's okay with you. So, um, and, and until 18, 1948, it, this was a British colony. Now, of course, there was World War II, and the, the terrible things that were happening under Japanese rule in, in Burma at the time. And then only uh, in 1948 did it gain its independence, and then it tried to be a democratic nation, but the tremendous strife and the violence between these various ethnic groups finally prompted the military to step in. And so it was from 1962 onwards until just last year, it was, in effect, a military, uh, military uh, regime that ran this country. And you can have military regimes that sort of maintain the, let's say, the economic foundations of the nation, like at Chile, for example, or Greece in the 1970s, where we had a junta. In this case, uh, the, the military leadership and a clique around them took control of all of the principal assets in the country. And as a result, the population, which had reached a certain level of development and literacy under the British, we got to give them credit for that, basically receded into the Stone Age uh, to an extent that is astonishing. Even today, as I said, the level of human development ranks far, far behind the rest of Southeast Asia. And as you, if you go in, you, in your bus and you drive through the countryside, you will see that. Here are just a few pictures where I try to show what this nation is about. This is a nation still living in biblical times. This is a nation that has hardly emerged from the Iron Age. And, and you may find this funny, 
But um, when I wrote a book about the historical Jesus, uh, which was published last year by National Geographic, uh, when I tried to describe what life in Lower Galilee under the Herodians was like, I used, and my students helped me to gather this information, I used the, uh, in, uh, the statistics of Burma, because there is no nation today that so resembles the feudal agricultural structure of Lower Galilee with subsistence farming, with heavy taxation, with feudal governance as Burma of just a few years ago. So I was able to draw a lot of parallels between Burmese society, agricultural society, subsistence farming, and, and what Jesus is. Now, there is hope, and of course, as we all know, the hope is this woman, Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, some, some books have been published uh, in the last couple of months, maybe you've read them, uh, that depict her in not such a wonderful light, uh, that show her as a, a very egocentric woman who doesn't brook much discussion, who has a vision and is willing to pursue it, but is not necessarily open to other ideas. I mean, I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you need strong leaders like this to, to forge ahead and make changes because the odds are stacked against her. She has the entire military stacked against her. And uh, she is, of course, the, the head of the National League for Democracy. I'll be interesting to hear from you what your guides will tell you about her in the next three days. Um, you know, it's the multi-party system right now. And not only is she facing much resistance from the military bloc, which still controls about 60%, uh, but also, of course, other parties. But she was released from 15 years of house arrest in 2011, but you know what the, uh, what the military junta did? Just before they released her from house arrest, they quickly made it a, a law. They made a constitutional law amendment, which is very hard to change, that whoever wants to be president cannot be married to a foreigner. Of course, this was not at all directed at Sun Tzu Kyi, who happened to be married to a, a British person who he passed away unfortunately and she has British children who hold British citizenship. So of course this was directed at her and as a result she cannot be president. But, and here comes the big but, just in last November the NLD party finally was able to garner 86 percent. Now why that is important is you cannot overrule the military unless you have more than 67% in the Myanmar parliament. And so when she swept the election and garnered 86%, she is now in a position to really make some changes. And this is all very, very recent. Uh, of course, the, the president who was ultimately elected is Hu Chun Kiao, uh, who, uh, is legitimately the president, but he did something very, very interesting uh, just uh, in the last two weeks. I'm sure you may, perhaps you follow the news. She cannot be president. He was elected president. So they created a special role for her called state counselor. This all happened just in the last two weeks, folks. What is a state counselor? Well, nobody really knows. <laughs> That's the whole idea. <laughs> if you don't know, where her power begins or ends, she can do whatever the heck she wants, right? So that's what they did. It's a brilliant move. Brilliant move. So she is now state counselor. Well, what is that? Well, basically the idea is that she becomes sort of the prime minister, whereby Xin Kiao removes himself and becomes sort of a ceremonial president, similar to the parliamentary democracies that we have in Britain or Germany or Holland, you know, the president or the king is sort of a ceremonial figure. The real power is in the hands of the prime minister. So this is all happening as we, as we speak. And last Sunday, she did something truly astonishing. Uh, she released 86 prisoners, political prisoners, from prison. There are still several hundred. I think the number is just under 200 
political prisoners imprisoned by the junta. Uh, but she, as a trial balloon, she ordered 86 prisoners to be let go. Some of the leaders are still in prison. Uh, but she just, everybody is holding their breath right now. <laughs> you know, how far will the military let her go? So we are entering this country in an incredibly exciting time. And of course, we all hope that Sun Soon Ki is able to do the changes. So is this a new beginning? We sure hope so. And we'll be there over the next three days to witness it. We'll be witnessing history in a very important part of, of the world. So here is, here is Myanmar. It is a fairly large country. It, it's not unlike Thailand in its, in its shape. Uh, let me just come over here a little bit. Uh, as you can see, uh, here is Yangon. This is our destination, Yangon. Uh, and we are currently just about here. I just checked the, the map before I came up here. We are traveling the Andaman Sea, the Andaman Sea here, the Andaman Islands. Nobody really knows what that means, by the way, Andaman. It's supposed to refer to, it's Sanskrit, to uh, an Indian god, but nobody's ever trying to be able to figure that out. We're heading over here. And this is where we're going to be spending the next three days. Uh, further up north is Mandalay. I'll talk a little bit about that. And you can see we are really surrounded by all the usual suspects. <laughs> you know, uh, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, China, Bangladesh, India. So we're really at the, at the heart of uh, this wonderful territory. Now, this is actually a very notorious part of the world, because where we're sailing right now, I don't want to get you scared, everything will be fine, but we are literally on the fault line between two tectonic plates, the Burma and the Sunda, uh, which, which runs just about around here. And of course, these tectonic plates tend to make a ruckus once in a while. In fact, they were responsible for the tsunami in 2004, which originated uh, in, in this area. And as we go on, uh, population is 51 million. It's funny because uh, just uh, 2014, they decided to finally figure out how many people live in our country. <laughs> they didn't know. And people thought, oh, well, you know, at least 60 or 70 million. It turns out only 51 million. People were flabbergasted. They thought many, many more people were living here. And of course, the majority, as, as we saw in Thailand and as we saw in uh, also, of course, in uh, Kuala Lumpur and in Malaysia, they always live along the river and near the coast. So this is where most of the people live here in the Irrawaddy River, which runs all around. That is the, the Nile of Myanmar, Myanmar right here. See that? This is the Irrawaddy River. I'll show you a, a satellite picture of that. And of course, then here, oops, went a little bit too far. Uh, here is you have the Himalayas, which again, as we saw in Thailand, sort of run throughout the crown of this region. And here is where all this opium is cultivated. This is called the Golden Triangle. And of course, under the military, they didn't care as much as long as they made a lot of money. So that's where a lot of the opium came from. Here is a satellite picture. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is look at the incredible silt that is being deposited by the Iriwadi. See that here? Here comes the river. Look at the incredible silt that is being deposited. You can only see that from, from space. And that's, of course, a major problem for the future and for marine wildlife, but also for the future of, of the country. As I said, it has many different cultures and tribes. In fact, there are 130 different languages. I, I'm not making this up. 130 different languages spoken. So they, you know, they have uh, an official language, uh, but the English, of course, is, is still very much spoken. Uh, although sometimes when you have a sort of a, a, a younger person, uh, the, the older generation tend to speak uh, a little bit of English. The younger generation does not as much. Uh, uh, taxi drivers will probably be able to speak a little bit of English, but shopkeepers, not always. It is a Buddhist nation, and so I've organized my lectures in such a way that, that I would like to address the three 
great religions that we will be encountering on this trip. So today I would like to talk about Buddhism. Uh, when we go to India, I'll talk about Hinduism. And then when we go to Oman, I'll talk about Islam. Is that okay with you guys? So, so we get real sense of... I, I tell you why, because, you know, in, in, in our West, you know, we have sort of separated the church from state and work life, right? Uh, not in these countries. In these countries, you cannot see or breathe anything un unless you think of it in religious terms. Religion permeates these societies in virtually every aspect of daily life, just as it was in biblical times in many ways. And so it's important to understand a little bit about Buddhism in order to understand what, what makes Myanmar tick. So about 80 to 90 percent are Buddhists of the Theravada tradition. This is the, t the tradition that we also find in, in Thailand. Uh, Vietnam has a different branch, but there is a very particular aspect of Theravada Buddhism that we'll talk about. There are still Christians here. I'll show you a beautiful church in a minute. Uh, paganism still thrives in the hinterlands among these various ethnicities. 4% is Muslim, 2% is Hindu, but uh, there is not a whole lot of religious tolerance here. Uh, and so uh, in recent years, 200,000 Muslims have left for Bangladesh, and Christians also report a certain amount of uh, discrimination, uh, and it is hoped that Sun Tzu Ki will be able to address this as, as, as well. Cultural influence, though, are overwhelmingly Buddhist. Now, it's interesting that Buddhism and Hinduism both originated from India, and yet, just like Christianity in the way, Buddhism would flourish outside of the nation of its birth. Just with Christianity. Christianity was born in Roman Palestine, but found its greatest flourishing in Europe and beyond in Roman Europe. Same here. Buddhism, while it was born in India, really would find its fertile ground in Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and, and Myanmar. Uh, and, and, and that happened gradually uh, because, as we will see in India, it's never really a, a black and white situation. Okay? When, when, these, when these Buddhist missionaries arrived here, they skillfully blended Buddhist teachings with whatever the people were believing at the time. Same with Christianity, you know. Chris, Christmas is a Roman holiday. It's the Roman holiday of the solstice. And so similarly, these missionaries sort of took the best parts of whatever people believed in it at the time, and that's where you see this, what we call in scholarship, syncretism where there is never really what you call a pure Buddhism. The Buddhism that exists here and in India and other places has sort of mingled with uh, many of these, these local beliefs, particularly animism, the belief in spirits, which we will find in India a lot, believe in spirits, that the fact that a tree or even a stone can hold a spirit, which, of course, is very important. So over the years... Hinduism and Buddhism grew here until around the 9th and 10th century, Buddhism, Buddhism became triumphant. And from that point on, you really see that Hinduism sort of dies away. And right now, Buddhist, Buddhism is the principal religion of, of the country. And Buddhist monks and Buddhism has a tremendous influence uh, in, in this nation. Now, the Theravada tradition... The Theravada canon came from Sri Lanka compared to the Mahayana tradition. You're probably more familiar with Mahayana, which is in Vietnam. But again, it, 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 it absorbed many of these, of these different influences. But the important thing to remember is that Buddhism isn't really a religion at all. Actually, it, it doesn't believe in a system of gods or God. Uh, it is really what we call, what, what psychologists would call a system of self-actualization. And of course, you know, the, the Buddha is worshipped as a divine being, and, and there is a great amount of divine strength and spirit involved, but it is not 
your typical religion where we basically need to communicate with a divine figure and the divine figure basically governs our life and, and through the strength of our prayer can we find a path through the different challenges of our lives. Buddhism is, is quite different from there. Buddhism says that, and this it shares with Hinduism, that, that we are in a process of reincarnation and it's not a good thing. Uh, because after this life we may be reborn as a human being of a particular class or caste, or we can be born in the form of an animal. The, the, the boundaries between animals and human beings are, are very vague. And so to get out of this endless cycle of, of reincarnation in which we constantly have to struggle with the material needs of our daily lives, Buddha says we must rise above that. We must rise above our material concerns, whether we need property or clothes or, or food, or we must bring ourselves to a higher level, to an enlightenment where we will reach nirvana. And when we reach nirvana, we will become one with the cosmic power that permeates life, and we will be liberated from the yoke of reincarnation. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is what animates Buddhism. And as long as you understand that, you understand basically everything there is to say. And yes, there are, of course, there are many, many different things uh, that can guide you. There is the Buddha himself. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment because you're going to see lots of Buddha statues. And I want to basically show you a little bit about what they mean, what, what unique symbols are there. But there was also the writings, and I'll talk a little bit about the writings when we come to India. I, I want to just not overpower you with all this stuff, um, the Dhamma. And there, of course, is the Sangha, the, the Buddhist community. And this is where the rubber meets the road, because Buddhists, they're not just sitting under a Bodhi tree being enlightened, you know. Of course, that is the ultimate goal. But they're not just locking themselves on the monastery. We've we seen in the West, we have this idea, this stereotype. Oh, Buddhist monks, they sit there and they go, mom, mom, mom. You know, that, right? That's sort of the idea we have. No, no, no. They're very much part of a living community. In fact, you can compare them with clergy in Western society. These monks, they, 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 they help you with birth. They, they're at death. They're there at an important moments in your life, they're, they're, they're pastors in, in many ways, which is why they are so incredibly held in high esteem. For example, every young man is expected, as part of his education, to spend some time in a monastery. Uh, and that's where he is groomed for this life. Of course, there, this is where he learns about Buddhist theory, Buddhist writings, but also to practice the life of a Buddhist monk. So every male in Burma has pretty much gone through that experience, which is another way why that religion is so deeply ingrained in, in that society. Now, never, ladies, never touch uh, a Burmese man wearing the robes of a monk, because they must practice chastity in every which way. And for example, they. They are so revered. For here you can see that they're on this little ferry here. Space for monks. Do you see that? So there, there, there are places in everyday life where this is the, one of the best places on the ferry. And ferries can get pretty, pretty crowded. So great realm. These, of course, are young uh, novitates uh, spending their one year or whatever it is uh, in, in, a, in a monk, you can see their very solemn faces, you know, uh, and they're very much self-aware of the importance that they are now a Buddhist monk. And of course, in a year from now, these kids will be in university or in the fields or whatever. But they do spend this one year or so in a monastery. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do that with our own kids? You know, I think I think if we could send our kids for a year, I think it would be a great thing. You know, no iPads, no texting. That's it, King. Just spend a year in a monastery. This is good for you. Great idea. I, I once presented to my children. They were not impressed. Uh, of course, they're all old now. They're all in their 20s and 30s, but 
too late now. Maybe the grandkids. I'm going to try, work on my grandkids. How's that? You will, you will find uh, lots of things we're going to see um, in, in a what. Now, I, I refer to a what in my first lecture, and I promised I would explain what that is. So I'll move you to right now. Uh, a, a what is um, a sort of a, a, a sacred space. It's a sacred space but it's also a civic space, not unlike uh, ancient synagogues. You know, when the first synagogues were being built in the diaspora, and now this is a topic of great debate, but let's say from the first century BC onwards, uh, synagogues were not just places where you could come together and read the Torah uh, on Shabbat, but whenever something was happening in the community, that's where the community came together uh, in moment of joy, and in moments of crisis. And the Buddhist what is somewhat similar. It is the center of the Buddhist, of the Burmese community. Not just for religious purposes, that's very important too, but for all the important things that are going on in the community. So typically in a Buddhist what, and this goes for the small village as well as for the great what's that we will see in Yangon, is the idea of uh, a central temple, pretty much like a Greek Acropolis, right? Uh, at the center of the Wat stands the Bot, the main hall, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Bot. And that is where you will see the Buddha. I'll talk about the Buddha and why that statue is so important in a minute. And there's lots of ornamental mythological things around it. I'll explain that in a moment. But there is always a depiction of the Buddha. Why is that? So many people have asked me that in past uh, trips to this area. Why are there always so many Buddhas? <laughs> you know? And it's basically the same reason why in Christian churches we see so many crucifixes. Um, and the Germans have a wonderful word for it. They call it Andachtsbild. Andachtsbild, which means that, whereas, you know, that when we imagine the divine, we like to have something to look at. You know, we are creatures of our six senses. It's very different. Some people can do it. Some people can communicate with the divine simply by meditation. But many of us, we need something to aspire to, something to focus our energies on. And in the case of the Buddha, that is especially important because for Buddhists, the Buddha is the impersonification of that enlightenment to which we all strive. And I'll show you some of the symbolic gestures. That's why, just as there is a depiction of Jesus in Christian churches, uh, that's why we have so many Buddhas. It is where we can focus our energies on. Now, next to the Bot is a Vihan. And a Vihan is similar to a Bot, except it has less of a sacred significance. This is an assembly hall. This is where things happen. Whereas you meditate and pray in a bot, you sort of in the wehan, we come together in the community and, and deal with whatever is going on. That's where monks and lay people have access. And finally, a chedi. Chedi is, a, that's the, the beautiful thing, you know, that gold stupa. A chedi is a shrine. And as your guide will tell you, a chedi is where the important scriptures are kept. Every village chedi has some document of the Buddhist writings, similar to a bhima or an ark in a synagogue, for example. That's where these, these scriptures are kept, and sometimes even a relic. Just like medieval Christianity, Buddhism is crazy about relics. Uh, and not just of the Buddha. Uh, anyone who has achieved enlightenment by himself, completely in an, in an autonomous way, is called a Buddha. So the sculptures you may see may represent the historical Buddha, the Gautama, Prince Gautama, or other Buddhas who have achieved the same sense of self-enlightenment uh, as, as Buddha himself. So that's a chedi. And then finally, we have uh, a bell tower, which doesn't always appear, but a bell tower or the Horang Kung, of course, can summon the faithful in times of need. This, of course, is the typical bell-type structure that you would associate with a chedi. It comes from Sri Lanka. Uh, and, and, this is, and this, of course, is a very beautiful one. This one happens to be in Bangkok. 
and that is as, as ubiquitous to the Burmese landscape as you would see a, ch a church tower in, in, in Europe or a minaret. But in the case of Burma, we do have some minor modifications. First of all, the shape is a little rounder because it depicts the begging bowl of Buddha upside down. You know, you're, not, you're never supposed to purchase your own food in Buddhism. If you're a monk, you must subsist on whatever the community gives you. And of course, if you do give something to a monk, it is highly, highly rewarded. You get bonus points. I don't want to be dis you know, <laughs> disrespectful. But, but it all adds up to your climb into to full enlightenment. So that's the significance of the bowl. And then the spire is his walking staff. Now, typically on top, there is a iron filament because that is actually designed to function as a lightning rod. Many of these things are covered with metal, uh, tend to attract a lot of lightning strikes, so that's why many of them have to have a, a large rod at top. Of course, what I'm showing you here is the great Shwedagon Pagoda, Shwedagon Pagoda, and you will hear a lot about the Shwedagon Pagoda. It is by far the central focal point of Yangon, of old Rangoon, and it is Ladies and gentlemen, it is, I think, one of the top ten places in the world. Uh, it is an incredible experience to see this great sacred precinct of Shwedagon. Uh, it is 60 tons of gold. That's a lot of gold. That's a lot of gold. It is considered uh, a, a great, great benefit to your Buddhist ascendancy if you put gold on a stupa. So this is not done by one individual. These are thousands of the faithful who have come and applied a piece of gold, you know, with their hard-earned money to apply that, and it's considered a major sign of respect for the Buddha. 60 tons of gold. Uh, and, uh, of course, there are other styles. There are lots of civic styles. As you can see here, this is the royal precinct uh, that, that we see in Mandalay. And these uh, building styles are very much in keeping with what we see in Thailand. And I'm just showing you that because uh, on, on past cruises, people have asked, well, what about Mandalay? Don't we, I always hear about Mandalay, you know, the, the lost city. But what happened to that? Well, Mandalay, as I showed you before, is sort of in the center of the country. It was a royal capital for a long time of the Burmese kingdom uh, until the British came. Um, and, but it's, it's pretty far. It's about 450 miles north of Rangon, so I'm not sure if many of us will be able to see it. Uh, and even though today Nai Pie Da is the official capital, the, the military junta went there just uh, 10 years ago, uh, Mandalay is still sort of the cultural heart, if you will, of uh, Myanmar. But Yangon by definitely is the economic heart. This is the entry point between Myanmar and the West. And so much of the investments that are currently pouring into Yangon, uh, into Myanmar, are all centered in this area. And actually, that was the real reason why the military decided to open up to democracy, because nobody was investing in the country. No transparency. Well, if you're an investor, you're not going to invest in a country when there is no transparency of the rule. Certainly not because so much corruption was keeping the resources of the country uh, into this tight clique. And that's really the reason why the military is opening up. Not because they are suddenly infused with a great democratic spirit, but they realize that without investment, uh, the country is not going very far. And much of that is located right here, the city where we're going to spend the next three days, at the confluence of two rivers, Yangon, and Bago. And uh, this is where a lot of the development takes place. But you will see, for example, uh, here's a shot from uh, space. I always like to, to, to show you these things because you can really see sort of the relationship between uh, the sprawl. Remember the sprawl I showed you of Kuala Lumpur? Compare that to this. It's all green, right? So you have a very small area of, of urban development, but the vast part 
of the surrounding countryside, and you'll see that from your bus, is still rural, feudal, subsistence. A lot of development still has to take place. This is Rangoon, Yangon, and look, look, there's no infrastructure. You see that? <laughs> see how telling that is? There's hardly any, other than the, here's the colonial city, of course, the colonial heart, and there are a few roads here, but look at, there's hardly any development going on in surrounding areas, and that's where this, this city really needs to do a lot of work. For that reason, as I mentioned in my early lecture, in my first lecture, this is unlike any other city that we will see uh, from the old British colonial period, because unlike Kuala Lumpur, unlike Mumbai, this is still sort of frozen in time. And so you will see far more old colonial structures uh, than we'll see anywhere else, such as, you know, we could be, we could be anywhere. This is uh, one of the min uh, ministerial buildings. Of course, they're falling in disrepair. You can see that because since the, uh, since the military moved the capital away, uh, much of these buildings are now empty, and they're very much dilapidated. This is the Yangon City Hall, the first building to be designed by a Burmese architect. Uh, you can see the wonderful multi-tiered roofs, which are, of course, we saw earlier in Mandalay. But for the remainder, of course, it's still very much a British conceit. Railway station, all of these beautiful colonial buildings are still standing there, and they're still functioning, because they haven't gone the time <laughs> or the money uh, to uh, replace them with these big glass towers that we see in Singapore, and uh, Kuala Lumpur. Here, you, this could be, you know, standing here, you, you might think you're in West London, you know, <laughs> isn't it? Look at these leafy trees and beautiful Victorian architecture. Uh, it's all still there. Now, this is interesting because uh, this is St. Mary's Cathedral. My mother is Dutch, and this was built by uh, a famous Dutch architect, uh, Joseph Kuypers. My mother's last name is Kuypers. I'm not quite sure if they're related or not, but uh, in the late 19th century, the Kuypers family was one of the leading Gothic builders of neo-Gothic churches, and uh, his son built this great cathedral. It's very similar to the cathedral that you find in Eindhoven, which is built by his father, Pierre Kuypers. So, beautiful cathedral, neo-Gothic, 19th century brick, uh, and of course, your guide will undoubtedly show you this building as well. This is the famous Strand Hotel. But uh, it's often <coughs> said that these were built, that this hotel was built by the Sarkis brothers. That's not true. Uh, it was built by John Darwood. And then the Sarkis brothers, they of, of course, the Raffles Hotel in Singapore, decided to purchase it. And that's, of course, when it gained its great uh, fame. This is where Somerset Maugham and all these other great British authors through the days of the Raj stayed. And uh, it's just been uh, remodeled. I'm not sure if you have the chance to go inside. If you do, you'll be amazed because it's really a step back into the 19th century. And I'm, Have you been to Raffles, the hotel in Singapore? Yeah? Well, I think it's terrible <laughs> because uh, and we've been going to Singapore for a long time because it is no longer, you know, it's sort of a kitschy, kitschy version of, of what it was. It's become so big, so spread out, uh, there is really not, not a sense of the old colonial flavor if, if that's something that, you know, you would like to see. I mean, it's because of its, its, its great cultural significance that I think it's important. Here, here you'll see a hotel just as it existed in the days of the Raj you know, Agatha Christie walking through, oh, hi, you know. This is really a wonderful experience. They do a mean tea uh, in the afternoon. So if you have time, we're here for two and a half days, check it out. And this is truly original. Uh, they don't have a pool. <laughs> you know, somebody asks, do you have a pool, sir? No, sir, we do not have a pool. You know, it's, uh, they're very proud of that. Tourism is desperately needed and Myanmar because of obviously the economic reasons, but uh, it's, the city only has 3,000 rooms. Can you imagine that? That's about five hotels worth less. So uh, they're facing a problem. This, this country has never been on the map of tourism, post-war tourism. 
So they're really desperately trying to figure out what can we do? What can we do to make this open? Finally, let me just take you quickly through the Shwedagon Pagoda and the Buddhist symbols, and we'll call it uh, an end right there. This is, of course, the great, great heart of the city. Uh, now, it's, it contains the relics, uh, including eight hairs, at one point, eight hairs of the Buddha, but I'll show you some other pagodas that claim the same thing. So nobody knows what happened to the eight hairs of Buddha. Uh, some believe one is still there. Your guide will probably insist it's still there. Um, but it is a beautiful uh, sacred precinct. Uh, it built in the 10th century, fell into disrepair, and then has been restored from the 16th century onwards. This, for example, is a print from the 17th century, was, was already falling apart. And here, after the 18th century, uh, a lot of people began to work on restoring it to its great splendor. As you come through the gate from the south, you'll see the Sun Sea. These are mythological beasts that guard the entrance and entering. Look at this. Isn't that just a beautiful, beautiful thing? You must see this shrine, absolutely. Uh, at the top, Sainbu is a 76 carat diamond. And I hope your guide will take you to the spot where it sparkles and, and reflects the light on the pavement. It's really something else to see. 100 meters tall, about 320 feet tall. Uh, it is a beautiful area. See these things around it? These represent the various planetary elements, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Rahu, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Always walk around the Buddhist stupa in a clockwise fashion, not in a counterclockwise fashion. Always around the stupa in a clockwise fashion. And finally, here is the Buddha. Let me just leave, oh, I'm sorry, the Buddha Tung Pagoda is another pagoda you will probably see. It claims to have hairs of the Buddha, and inside is a gilded Buddha, which was taken by the British to London and only returned to Yangon after it became independent in 1951. Now, in conclusion, let me just explain a little bit about the Buddhas that you're going to see. A reclining Buddha re re uh, represents a Buddha having achieved nirvana having achieved that upper level. So when you see a lying Buddha, it means the Buddha has achieved that. Other Buddhas have very different gestures. When you see a Buddha with palms upwards on his lap, that is the symbol of meditation. That is the symbol of jhana. Okay? He is now meditation often under the Bodhi tree. When you see him with his left palm up and his right hand pointing to the earth, that is the connection to earth and resistance, the Buddhist resistance to material concerns. Bhumi Parsha. Bhumi Parsha. If you see the Buddha with his right hand turned up, that is the Buddha teaching. That is as he explains his teaching to his followers, Abhaya. And finally, when you see him with his finger together, that is when he strides forward in an intellectual argument. That is called Dharma Chakra. He is disputing, he is discussing his teachings with you. So each of these great, great, great statues have a unique role to play in the Buddhist religion. Well, I hope that I have just given you a little glimpse of what this experience will be like. Just a few more things to remember. Shorts or sleeveless shirts are not considered proper dress. So please dress conservatively. Be prepared that your shoes must have closed toes and you will be asked to take off your shoes as you enter the Wat. And please do not take pictures of the Buddha or certainly not posing in front of the Buddha or taking a selfie. That is considered uh, a bit rude. So uh, if you take a picture of the Buddha, do it very discreetly and don't put your loved one in front of it. Uh, because for Buddhists it is very much a very sacred image. And when you sit, many people will sit in meditation, keep your foot, or don't, don't stretch out your feet, but keep them under your knees so your feet don't
point towards the Buddha. These are just a few things to remember to make sure that, that we respect the people that are there. Well, I hope I have given you a little bit of a glimpse of what we can expect in the next three days. I hope you have a wonderful time here. And join me, please, for my next lecture about Cochin, Mangalore, and